so welcome everyone. Uh, it's nice to, to be back uh, here. Um, this semester we have a rich program consisting of 15 seminars and 30 speakers. As usual, uh, we invite two speakers that present two different approaches to one question in art and aesthetics. Our aim uh, is to create a space where we can facilitate and promote a true multidisciplinary discourse. Indeed, last week during our opening event, we discussed uh, the long-standing issue of what is art with Dan Raj Vishwanath and the artist Fulvia Carnevale. So if you missed that, you can always check out the recording on our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, today, we discussed the um, I discuss serial television, which is one of the youngest and most popular art products. Um, however, it is yet unclear how people cognitively engage uh, with it and how uh, uh, this format differs uh, from uh, cinema. Um, so just to remind you the format of the seminar, first we start with our speakers that will give their talk and then we will start the discussion. During the discussion, everyone will have a chance to ask a question or a comment. Um, today, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Zoe Shaklok, uh, who is a lecturer in film studies at the University of St. Andrews. Zoe's research focuses on the body and its representations in television during the rise of streaming, with a particular focus on gender, sexuality and empathy. Her most recent work addresses the implications of movement and spatial dynamics of the body in television screening. So, without further ado, uh, welcome Zoe. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and you're welcome to share your screen. Fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and to talk about um, my favorite topic, which is uh, serial television. So I'm just going to get my slides up there. Great. OK, um, so I uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I am a lecturer in film studies at, uh, here at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, and I do currently do a lot of work on embodiment on screen, but the kind of the big question I think that guides a lot of my work and is certainly where my work is going after this project, which is about how we define television's medium specificity. So what does television do specifically? How might we understand what the televisual is, um, which is the television counterpart to the cinematic? Uh, and how is this changing or to what extent is it being renegotiated in the age of streaming television as well? So I'm sort of approaching those questions at the moment through thinking about the body on TV, but those are kind of the big questions behind my work. Um, so I am a TV studies scholar and I'm going to approach this question of how we engage with serial television from sort of a TV studies perspective. If anyone in the audience is uh, quite familiar with a lot of television scholarship, uh, some of these ideas might be a little bit basic, so I apologize for that, but it is Friday afternoon, so um, you know, we don't want to make things too complicated on a Friday. Um, so I'm going to start off today with uh, a tale of two TV shows, uh, and this is a story about how we watch television, how we critique and evaluate TV, and how we define what TV is. So um, our main characters are WandaVision, which is the Disney Plus series focusing on the lives of Wanda and Vision, two characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and Ted Lasso, which is the Apple TV series about an American football coach who is hired to coach a Premier League team in the UK, despite knowing nothing about football or soccer for the Americans in the group. So both of these programs are released on streaming platforms, and I'm, I'm going to come back to this question of streaming versus broadcast television a little bit later. Uh, each of these shows was released with an episodic release schedule in which episodes are released weekly. And here, Disney Plus and Apple TV are very clearly distinguishing themselves from streaming competitors such as Netflix, which tend to release all episodes of a season at once. So for both shows, uh, this release strategy became a site of contention. Um, so this is what I like to call WandaVision, sorry, uh, IndieWire's bad WandaVision take, in which they said, after six episodes, WandaVision still feels far too much like an inflated feature film that keeps dragging out its story via inconvenient weekly installments. Um, so you can probably see the issue here. If we take out the slightly disparaging uh, language, 
IndieWire is complaining about an extended narrative released in weekly installments. Um, I mean, congratulations, they've just invented serial television. So unsurprisingly, people um, were kind of up in arms about this. And there was a lot of discussion on Twitter um, that IndieWire had completely missed the fact that WandaVision was TV. So people were saying things like, have you heard of this thing called network television? But that's what TV is. It feels like a TV show, etc. So even if the critics here were perhaps trying to blur the line between TV and film, audiences still seem to separate the two, and television is defined by serial narration. There's an almost identical discussion surrounding Ted Lasso. So just in the last couple of weeks, there's been critiques of the show's second season for lacking conflict and focus. I'm not going to go into the whole debate because we'll be here uh, all afternoon. But again, just to highlight some of the conversations happening around the TV program. So in Catherine Van Arendonk's review in Vulture, she notes that uh, audiences' frustration is essentially a frustration with seriality, but that this frustration is what serialization has always been about. That's what TV always was. And again, just on Twitter, people were saying, you know, everyone's forgotten how to watch a show without binging. So again, what stands out to me here is that people define TV as serialization. And so the debate surrounding what is TV and what is cinema unfolds not around the size of the screen or the place in which we watch something, but around this question of seriality. So the narrative structure and the temporal consumption pattern. Uh, and this isn't just what defines TV, but it's what TV does well, and it's what our experience of TV is meant to feel like. So uh, when we say the word serial television, we often think of serial dramas uh, or comedies, or maybe even soap operas, which is the quintessential example of television seriality. But if we think about the definition of a serial narrative, which is a story released in installments, television is full of them across the whole range of programs. So reality television programs, a serial narrative, certainly the competition programs, and that they do tell a story that unfolds over um, a season of episodes. Uh, a sports season has things in common with serial narratives as well in terms of kind of, you know, sequential installments that build to some kind of climax across the season. So serialization is key to our understanding and definition of TV and might also hold the key to why we watch TV and why we love it. Um, so I've been asked to reflect on how people engage with serial TV and how it differs from cinema. Um, and today I'm going to talk through some of those answers from a TV studies perspective. Um, in TV studies, there are a kind of a few different uh, a kind of angles that we would approach this question from. So one would be to think about narrative. So we could think about how a story is told across episodes or what an episode unit does, what a season unit does, what um, the role of cliffhangers might be. We can think about the industry and to think about why television chooses serialization as an industrial and economic strategy. Uh, and we can also think about audiences uh, and look at you know, how and why we watch serial TV and the role that it plays in our lives, the pleasures that it offers us, and in particular, the sort of significance of TV as an everyday medium. I'm gonna focus mostly on this last question, but the others will kind of crop up throughout the discussion as well. Um, because I am really interested in television as something that is embedded in our everyday life and TV as a kind of everyday medium. Okay, so um, first of all, I wanted to think a little bit about the temporal experience of serial television. Films are much more contained, isolated, and sporadic experiences. For the majority of us, we might go to the cinema a couple of times a month at most, maybe, um, most of us go much less often, and certainly in the last 18 months, we've all been going much, much less often to the cinema than we usually would. Cinema is an event. It's somewhere where we go out to into kind of a public space. Serial television, however, is watched on the home on a much more routine, regular basis. If we think about the traditional release schedule of serial TV, in which episodes are released according to a schedule, so it's on at the same time every uh, week or every night for a soap opera, um, it is a routine uh, kind of ritual experience. It's a ritual form of consumption in which you tune in at the same time to watch your particular program. 
There's a really fantastic term by media scholar Paddy Scannell, which is what he calls broadcasting's dailiness. And by this, Scannell means that TV is both embedded in the temporal structure of everyday life, but it also helps to construct those temporalities. Our sense of time within a day, across a week, and throughout a year is shaped by broadcast media. So uh, we know that it's 6 p.m. because the BBC News is on, and the same at 10 p.m. as well. Uh, we know it's Christmas time when we're watching Christmas films and Christmas episodes on our television screens. Um, and watching Doctor Who means that it's Saturday night, and Paddy Scannell himself has a really lovely description of Doctor Who as inseparable from the pleasures of winter weekends. So Scannell suggests that the broadcasting calendar creates a horizon of expectations, a mood of anticipation, a directedness towards that which is to come, thereby giving substance and structure to everyday life. So today is Friday. For those of us in the UK, we might be looking forward to going home and watching Gogglebox at 9 p.m. on Channel 4, which is the same time that it's always on. Um, I'm also looking forward to watching the new episode of Ted Lasso, which is released on Fridays. So for me, Ted Lasso marks out that moment when the week turns into the weekend, helping to structure my sense of time and my experience of everyday life. Uh, I really love this idea of dailiness because I think it really encapsulates what makes our experience of serial TV different, suddenly to cinema. So serial television is like a heartbeat in our lives. It's a constant rhythm that helps us keep track of time and helps to create that sense of time. And it regulates and constructs our experience of the week. And again, we can link this back to television's status as an everyday medium rather than the eventfulness of the cinema. And I think this question of dailiness is something that really came to the fore in the last year when many of us spent a lot of time in lockdown. So when I teach my students television, a lot of them remark that they don't watch much broadcast TV anymore. So this kind of scheduled experience is something that's a bit more foreign to them. Um, but during lockdown, the reverse happened and the regularity of television became a comfort to so many. And my students would often talk about how it gave rhythm to their lives when their days were all very much the same. So Scannell was, of course, referring to scheduled broadcast television. But of course, today, that's not the only way that we can watch serial TV. So with DVDs and with streaming and, of course, earlier, if you had a DVD um, television release on VCR as well, we could watch a season of television in a much more compressed format. But I think that we can still see a kind of modified dailiness at play in these slightly different consumption patterns. Because of the sheer length of serial television, even if you're marathoning something, you might still be watching it over an extended period of time, much longer than 120 minutes in the cinema. So if you come home every night for a week excited to watch the next episode of your TV show, serial television here is still giving temporal structure to your days and it's still embedded in the flow of your everyday life. It's just that that structure of dailiness is now perhaps controlled by audiences more than controlled by schedulers. And this is something that TV with its segmented episode units and its lengthy narratives does and facilitates particularly well. Uh, and this brings me to the next element of temporality. So as well as repetition, serial television involves duration. A film is 120 minutes, maybe longer if you're James Cameron, but serial television can continue for years. It becomes something that we live with and something that kind of becomes built into the very fabric of our lives. And this means that the continuous unfolding nature of serial television becomes a way for us to work through our own lives. John Ellis has um, a really nice idea about television as acting as a form of working through in which we use TV, uh, whether nonfiction or fiction, to work through and unravel various social issues or personal issues. In serialized TV, such working through becomes a way for us to work through our own lives and our own emotions. And this is why so much of serial television is invested in interpersonal relationships and private lives, because it reflects the concerns of its audience. Um, Misha Kafka notes that TV is something that we've always turned to, to see other people and to see other lives. And serial television in the way that it becomes embedded in our own lives, sort of becomes a way in which we can work through those questions of our own lives. Like our own lives, serial TV resists closure, and like our own lives, it is an unfolding story. Um, I've got a picture up here. This is a picture from the UK uh, soap opera Coronation Street. 
uh, because I think so much of the serial TV that we love is really just a soap opera in disguise because they're both concerned with the very same things, ripple effects across small communities, whether colleagues or friends or romantic partners. Uh, Mad Men is not unlike a soap opera. Game of Thrones is basically a soap opera with some sex and violence thrown in its window dressing. Prestige dramas and soap operas are both just different iterations of serialized storytelling. And on TV, that always comes back to this kind of question of working through private lives and emotions and relationships. And so in this sense, we live with serial TV and it kind of lives with us as well. So uh, while TV might be watched in ways that are more private than the public space of the cinema, uh, this doesn't mean that TV is an isolated experience. And in fact, the opposite is true. So many of you will have heard of the term the water cooler show, which refers to a TV show in which weekly episodes become must see events that dominate conversation the following day. So workers would congregate around the water cooler to talk about the episode. There's been a lot of discussion about whether the water cooler show is becoming obsolete as the television audience fragments across increasing numbers of channels and streaming services and platforms and all kinds of things, there are fewer programs that we share together. Uh, I don't think the water cooler show is going anywhere. I think there are ways in which it might be articulated in slightly different forms and on slightly different scales. But serial television still at its heart is something that is a communal experience and offers communal pleasures. So cinema, again, obviously a communal experience. It's a bunch of people in the theater together watching the same film. But serial television is also a communal experience because it's meant to be shared. So its very structure encourages us to talk about the programs that we watch, to speculate where the narrative is going and what might happen in the next episode. You know, that's what cliffhangers do. I deliberately started my talk today with some examples of Twitter discussion because social media is a fantastic visualization of the kind of talk that's always existed around serial TV. Television seriality episodes released in installments, it's designed for audiences to talk about it. And many uh, shows these days do deliberately encourage this through mystery narratives or through dense plotting, through having you know clues and foreshadowing and things like that. So, um, which encourages audiences to talk to each other, whether online or in person, to kind of unravel and predict what's happening in the narrative. Uh, Lost is the quintessential example here, but we see it in everything from UK shows like I May Destroy You to Line of Duty, which is on the slide here, or I think um, quite recently shows in the US like White Lotus and um, Mayor of Easttown as well. Films allow us to unravel them after the fact, but in TV, this interpretive talkative community continues across the weeks. So TV acts and serial TV acts as a kind of uh, like social common ground or a social gathering place and a shared cultural event on a scale that a lot of films can't really aspire to. Um, and this comes back to television status as a mass medium. Um, so just briefly, this communal power we can link back to sort of the connection between television and liveness, um, which is, you know, the idea on the one hand that some television shows are broadcast live, but in terms of our experience that when we watch TV, we know that there are other people out there watching this same program live in this moment with us. Um, liveness is an ideological construction on television rather than something that's sort of innate to the medium, as uh, Jane Fewer points out. Um, but it is still something that's really key to understanding what our experience of serial TV is. And this largely operates through what we call co-presence, which is the way in which our liveness and sort of um, that kind of live feeling of television allows us to, uh, members of an audience to feel connected with one another across a country or a region, or members of the audience might feel like they're watching the program at the same time. So just as Ella says, it's that sense that others, anonymous though they may be, are sharing that same moment. So even though today serial TV doesn't have to be watched live, so you can watch it on like a catch-up service or you can record it or you can watch it, you know, on DVD or on streaming, obviously that doesn't have a live component. Um, these feelings of co-presence are still really key to how audiences engage with serial TV. And we see this in the way that people live tweet TV shows or they form watch parties and things in order to watch together. 
And again, it's this sense of participating in a shared unfolding cultural text, which is something that cinema doesn't provide uh, on the same scale or in the same way. So uh, just to end the presentation, I just want to come back to this question of streaming, um, which is you know, something that I'm really interested in at the moment. Within television studies, the hot question at the moment is to what extent, if at all, is streaming television television? So is Netflix TV? Um, is you know, Disney Plus TV? And seriality at the moment is a key kind of, uh, one of the key stakes in this debate. When we think about streaming services like Netflix, one of the main criteria that they use to define their original series as TV is first and foremost the fact that they are serialized narratives, extended stories told in segmented units. It's not kind of anything else to do with um, more traditional elements of television, such as um, broadcasting or a schedule. It's that question of a serialized uh, narrative structure. So then again, we can think about how this question of serialization is something that's really key to how we understand and define the television experience. Whether it's social connection or temporal structure or a means of working through our own lives. Um, and so I guess the question is, do we see some of these elements in streaming TV? And I think, I mean, I think to some extent, yes. So streaming television is still embedded and encountered in everyday life, and it still uses that season and episode structure. And there are ways in which our streaming services very deliberately try to solicit those kind of traditionally televisual feelings of serialized consumption. A dailiness and those feelings are still possible on streaming, whether it's because a program is released weekly or whether it's because we create it themselves. Uh, Co-presence is still um, kind of at play here, although in a slightly different way. So when you load up your Netflix account, for instance, you'll always see that it's telling you which shows are popular or trending or top 10 in your area. And again, this is because Netflix here is perhaps trying to create a sense of a shared viewing community that you can be part of because you're watching what's trending, what's popular. There are other people out there watching at this particular moment too. And of course, you know, we still see a lot of these streaming services do deliberately try and encourage people to talk about their shows through social media. Um, my personal feeling is that I think something is lost in the kind of uh, the Netflix release strategy when shows are released all at once, but we might save that for the discussion time. Um, and I do have a very kind of fond um, place in my heart for the episodic weekly television release schedule. So um, what I've kind of just tried to do today is to illustrate some of the specific features of TV that shape how we experience serial narrative. So dailiness, co-presence, community, working through and living with TV, which are all really key ideas in TV studies. And just to think again about how we experience that extended unfolding narrative of serial television as something that's embedded in our everyday lives. All right, that is me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoloi. That was great. I'm sure we'll have a very interesting discussion. But we're now moving to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Professor Joseph Megliano. Joseph is a professor of educational psychology at the Department of Learning Sciences of Georgia State University. One of Joseph's key research interests involves serial television, that is, how people understand what they watch how different mental processes support this comprehension. And Joseph also investigates the nature of memory representations that we create for events we witness when watching a movie. Joe, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, We're very happy to host you. Um, you're welcome to share your screen and whenever you're ready. Thank you. Do you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to um, uh, be a part of this um, this uh, series. And Zoe, lots of stuff to talk about. I'm really excited to, um, when we move to the uh, point where we can talk about our, our presentation. All right, let me see how I advance. All right, this, there we go. Okay. Uh, I am going to be uh, um, uh, talking about some ideas regarding the cognition of serialized TV. And we're here today because uh, um, there has been this rise in the popularity of serialized TV over the past couple decades. Um, 
I think uh, one could argue that um, there are features to serialized TV, and you, you see features, uh, these features present even in shows that we might not conceptualize as, as serialized um, TV. Um, uh, now, this has um, led to a rise of interest in the humanities. Zoe, I could put one of your papers on this list. It's just an example of, of some uh, uh, papers from scholars in the humanities exploring different aspects of serialized TV. However, um, discourse psychology, that's the subfield of cognitive psychology where you'll find research on what's involved in the cognition of understanding narratives. Um, th this is the, 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 the sub area of cognitive psychology where I view myself um, uh, in my research being aligned. Um, and uh, th this area, uh, it's, it's like many areas of, of behavioral science, it's, it's a reductionist approach to understanding a phenomenon. You're zeroing in on a specific phenomenon and developing an um, empirical approach to understanding the phenomena. Uh, now, this area uh, of, of, of psychology focuses on um, what's, uh, what the cognitive processes are that give rise to uh, narrative comprehension. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the visual media, uh, um, visual narratives is relatively understudied within this field. I, I can only think of myself as a person that has a sustained program of research. People dabble here and there. Um, that said, in uh, the larger field of cognitive psychology, there is a growing uh, um, interest in the study of visual narratives. But serialized TV really isn't on the radar screen, uh, as as I that I know of. And there are some practical constraints given our modes of inquiry in um, the psychological sciences that would make it challenging, uh, um, but not impossible. I think there's lots of good reasons for the cognitive study of serialized TV, but I also feel that this is an area that would be ripe for interdisciplinary collaboration. What I want to do in uh, this um, my, my time today is uh, to explore some of uh, what might be involved in understanding the serialized TV cognitively. Uh, um, uh, what, what, what's cognitively involved in understanding serialized TV? And I'm going to share with you some ideas put forward in a, a book chapter in a edited uh, volume uh, by Ted Nanasili and Hector Perez. Um, um, and we were asked to um, contribute some thoughts on, on the cognition of serialized TV. And what we did was take a step back and, and reflect upon some of the core constructs uh, from theories of comprehension and apply them to understanding how a particular series works, Westworld. So I, I'm certainly not going to be able to explain Westworld, if you can, but I, I, I want to demonstrate how some of the constructs I'm going to introduce uh, um, uh, potentially uh, um, um, explain how a convention used in that series might work. And, um, you know, I hope this is uh, the start of, uh, of a discussions on uh, interdisciplinary um, uh, research on uh, serialized TV. So let's talk about the basics of um, uh, co the cognition of serialized TV. I, I want to contrast non-serialized TV shows from serialized TV shows to start. So in non-serialized TV shows, the, um, the problems that characters address and their goal plans to address those problems are encapsulated within the individual episodes. They don't extend beyond episodes. And as such, there are weak temporal constraints across the episodes and you can consume a non-serialized TV show and uh, the series, uh, um, the episodes in any order you want and still enjoy them. And, and you, know, you don't need to understand the, the season. You, you need to understand and comprehend the individual episodes. But in serialized TV, um, the problems um, faced by characters uh, extend across 
episodes and therefore their goal plans extend across episodes. And this is Attack on Titan. Uh, it's an anime series that explicitly marks the problems that uh, characters are dealing with. Um, uh, so there is a strong, there are strong temporal constraints on the order in which you can, um, uh, that you need to process the episodes. And you have to establish a, a rich network of semantic relationships across the episodes to make sense of, of a season and potentially a series, depending on the nature of the series. Well, how do we do this? Uh, theories of comprehension um, you know, specify that it, it emerges when we construct memories for uh, narrative experiences. Now, much of this research has been conducted in the context of, of text and um, not, you know, text written by experimenters to uh, exert a high level of control. Uh, there's very few people that actually use um, existing artifacts in their programs of research. Nonetheless, um, we've gained some insights on what's involved in making sense of, of, of narratives. Uh, and we believe that it emerges with the construction of a memory that we, we call a mental model. And theories of um, uh, um, comprehension, they, they focus on delineating the processes that give rise to um, this mental model and the product, the nature of the product. What is What tends to be represented? How is the memory organized? And, you know, lots of research has uh, shown that when we experience a narrative, we're, we're clearly going to represent the events and the, the, the components of those events, um, the entities that are part of those events, where those events happen in a spatial temporal framework. And importantly, um, we are establishing the relationships uh, between uh, the, uh, the sub-events that make up events and the events that make up a, a larger narrative. Uh, Jeff Foy and I argued that to understand a, um, uh, that really any TV series, um, we have to build a um, multiple uh, mental models. And uh, we, we called this sort of grouping of mental models story world models. And um, we need to represent the event models. And this is what uh, um, theories of, of narrative comprehension typically sp specify. Um, and this is um, uh, mental models that represent the events and the inferences about those events. Um, we need to build um, mental models of the characters. Uh, and you know, the, these mental models might um, be similar to the kinds of mental models we build for people in our, in, that we experience in our everyday lives. And we need to build models of, of the rules that govern the, the narrative world. This is a, a topic that Jeff Foy um, has uh, studied um, in, in his program of research. Uh, and this is particularly important if you're um, uh, um, uh, for narratives that deviate from how, um, uh, uh, that have fantastical elements that deviate from how the real world works. But in the event models, that's where you really see uh, differences between non-serialized and serialized television. There's a nesting of mental, mental uh, event models that we need to build. As we experience a scene, we need to build an event model of that scene. And I would say this is similar with film and, and, and movies. We need to build uh, event models of the scenes and, and the events that they're conveying and our um, understanding of how those events are related to the larger episode. So we have to build uh, a representation of the episodes, which is the uh, um, the, the uh, really the the events depicted in the scenes and how they're related within the episodes. And at the season level, we need to understand how um, the events in the episodes are connected. So we need to establish relationships uh, across episodes. And uh, at the series level, we need to understand how series are, uh, the events depicted in seasons are related to series, depending on the nature of the, um, of the series. Um, uh, some series uh, have weak, um, don't have strong relationships across seasons, and some do. But, you know, the problems faced by, char by characters that extend across seasons. Uh, so, uh, the thing that distinguishes uh, non-serialized TV from serialized TV is you don't need to um, 
uh, your event models uh, uh, don't need to extend beyond the episodes, um, you know, because uh, the, the the problems that characters face uh, don't extend beyond the episode. You don't get this as Hector Perez uh, uses the term temporal prolongation of plot uh, um, elements. Uh, but in um, uh, uh, serialized TV, you need to establish these relationships uh, across episodes and series potentially. And um, this, you know, to to build these mental models and to establish these relationships, we are we need to access knowledge. Uh, we know that to build a, a mental model, you're uh, continually ac accessing knowledge and updating your your mental model. And the current content we're processing kind of serves as a, a passive retrieval cue. Um, you don't necessarily have to think about it beyond understanding it. And it leads to the activation of knowledge of information stored in the event model, um, uh, uh, the character models and the rule models, and relevant background knowledge. And that knowledge is then used to support the construction of inferences uh, that one would need to understand and evaluate the significance of the current event. And the mental model is iteratively updated to um, uh, reflect new information that's being processed and inferences. And you know, one of the challenges of serialized TV is we have to access inf uh, knowledge that we experienced it from an earlier episode. And uh, you know, we can talk about the, the, the challenges um, that um, uh, are created when watching, um, uh, um, you know, uh, series uh, over, uh, 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 you know, in, in weekly episodes versus streaming um, in, in, in the discussion. The final thing I want to talk about is a distinction made in theories regarding the relationship of the content represented in a mental model and the uh, source uh, of, of the source narrative. Uh, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is it helps us understand a convention used in Westworld, at least that's Jeff Foy and I's claim, uh, regarding um, uh, cueing the viewer when they need to update their um, event models, uh, character models, and rule models um, as this first season progresses. Uh, we can have memory for the service form or memory for exactly how information was conveyed. Uh, and it turns out that um, we, we don't have a very detailed memory for the surface form uh, as, as time moves forward. We, we, the, the cognitive system gives up uh, that, um, that information. Um, now, we can also uh, build uh, that the mental model can represent what we the, what we call the text base. And this is memory for what was explicitly conveyed, but not the manner or style in which it was conveyed. So uh, the text base, um, you know, is you know, memory for the events that the uh, filmmakers or series producers were intending to convey on the screen. Now the situation model refers to um, that part of the representation that reflects the inferences that we generate that help us understand how the, the events that make up the text base are connected to one another and, um, and our understanding of the world. And uh, it helps us drive a, uh, represent the underlying situation or circumstances that were uh, being conveyed in a scene, episode, uh, uh, um, season, and series. All right, I'm having, okay. Uh, we could uh, think about this as a, a process. We encounter uh, surface features that enable us to drive the text base, which serves as a retrieval cue, uh, uh, a retrieval cues to access the knowledge that enables us to build our story world models, which is our uh, basis for you know, engagement in uh, a, a narrative. So I wanna, um, uh, use some of the ideas I've introduced today to um, talk about a convention used in the series Westworld of repeating um, uh, uh, scenes at, to, to, uh, with varying level of overlap in the repetition in terms of the surface form and text base uh, um, to help 
indicate when there are is new important information that requires updating of the story world models. And uh, uh, we talk about this convention in the context of the CAN scene. Now, Westworld is a uh, um, you know, really complex uh, series. Uh, some may argue too complex uh, uh, to be enjoyed. Uh, others like the complexity. It takes place in, uh, in the future in an amusement park called Westworld uh, that can be construed as a sandbox environment if you've played tabletop games or video games. What that means is um, you, uh, the player or the guest can interact with agents, non-player uh, um, characters, or in this case, hosts that are robots. And these hosts have re repeated routines and the guests can interact with them in their routines and go on uh, adventures uh, that, the, um, that the hosts provide. Um, it's an extremely complex, a first uh, uh, season, uh, multi-layered plots, multiple characters with plot lines. I only have three listed here because they're important uh, for the can scene. There's Dolores and William. Uh, and Dolores is a host that is a main character in the first season and second season. William is a guest who is also a main character. And uh, th they go on an adventure uh, in the season. And it, um, uh, William falls in love with Dolores, uh, thinks that she is more than a non-sentient robot, which she is. You're, you're learning that there is something special and unique about Dolores. And William is picking up on that. Um, uh, we also hear about, learn about the man in black, who is, um, uh, you know, a antagonist of the first season, and he's on a mystery to solve um, the deep. He's on a uh, his mission is to solve the deep a deep mystery of the park. And Teddy is a character that in, um, intersects with a bunch of different storylines. I bring up bring him up here because he's part of. Um, the, the, the can scene convention I'm going to talk about. But there's many twists. It turns out that William is the man in black. We learned this in the season finale and that the Dolores and William storyline is actually a, a not happening in the narrative now and is a, is a, a, a flashback from long ago. Um, you know, the, um, the, the, the park is constructed actually to um, create a, a way of... of, of um, making humans immortal. Um, so the can scene, uh, it, uh, the first instantiation of the can scene takes place about um, uh, uh, eight, nine or eight minutes into the first season. And it, it there's 16 shots. It follows sort of traditional continuity editing, sequencing. Uh, Dolores, who is this robot, um, who is, uh, is sentient or developing sentience, uh, uh, walks up to her horse, a can falls out as she's putting her groceries in the saddlebag, and um, uh, uh, Teddy picks it up. Uh, well, this happens um, three uh, um, scenes into the first episode. In the first scene, we see Teddy arriving on uh, a train with a bunch of guests, which um, makes us believe that he is a guest, but he's actually a robot. Um, and this is cross cut it with a scene of Dolores being interviewed by an administrator. And um, there's a few shots of that, but the dialogue um, extends across the next two scenes. Uh, Betty, or not Betty, Teddy goes into a, a saloon after he goes into the train, uh, gets off the train, he's propositioned by a, a host. Um, uh, and then he turns that, that um, host down and uh, uh, sees Dolores, and we see our first instantiation of the can scene. Well, at this point, we are building character models of Dolores as a host, and this repetition uh, uh, of a host, she's a robot, and um, uh, you know, the event model that we're building thus far helps uh, uh, um, establish that um, that uh, character model uh, of, and we at this point think Teddy is a guest. Um, we don't know he's a robot. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this enables us to build our understanding of the rules of um, Westworld. Now you can figure it out uh, just by watching the show because they have 
they, they show um, um, host repeating behaviors and guests that are clearly de de delineated interacting with them. But if you have knowledge of the video game, uh, contemporary video game structure or how tabletop role playing games are structured, you will activate that knowledge uh, and use it to understand the underlying situation uh, that is being conveyed that would enable you to construct a mental model, the rules of uh, th this particular narrative. Well, um, the can scene happens in, in various degrees of repetition, uh, seven times across the season, uh, twice in each of the first uh, three episodes and once in the final episode. And it varies in overlap in the surface form and text space. And we argued that the degree of overlap um, cues the um, viewer in the levels of, of refinement or updating that they need uh, to engage in with respect to their event models, character models, and rule models. So the second instantiation happens about 20, 20 between 20, 25 minutes into the can scene. So Teddy and Dolores go on this adventure after the first instantiation of the can scene. And they end up at Dolores' homestead where they're met by the man of black man in black, some other guest, and some host. And apparently it's a mission to be there at the homestead when Dolores gets home and people, you know, you know, destroy the homestead and uh, you can assault uh, Dolores. It is a brutal environment. Um, now, the second instantiation has an almost exact overlap in the surface form um, uh, and overlap in the text base. But the underlying situation is different because the man in black picks up the can and has an exchange with Dolores that changes the nature of the situation in some important ways. He uh, indicates that um, he um, repeatedly uh, assaults uh, Dolores, and um, she demonstrates she has no memory of this uh, in this exchange. So this leads to sort of, um, uh, you know, this we're building an event model and we're continuing to build an event model and it's being refined uh, and updated to reflect that um, you know, this is an event that happens before uh, or after Teddy was killed. Um, we're refining our, our character models. Um, Teddy isn't in this scene, but I put him in here because at this point we know that Teddy is uh, uh, um, updated from a guest to being a host. And this continues to refine our understanding of the sandbox environment and uh, because you see the exact same structure. Uh, to the shot uh, sequence and um, lots of overlap in uh, the text base. The only thing that differs is who picks up the can. Um, in the second instantiation, there is very little overlap in the surface form and very little overlap in the text base. And um, our event model is going to contain information uh, that Dolores may um, be special. There's something going on with her. And um, uh, at this um, this happens in the third episode, uh, and you know that there's something going on with her, but she um, uh, stares, nobody picks up the can, she picks it up, and she stares at her reflection in the mirror, and this um, can lead to a memory retrieval of, you know, what sentient creatures do when they see mirrors, uh, they, they recognize themselves, and that might lead to updating of the uh, Dolores uh, model um, uh, as um, that she's becoming sentient. But we, we argue that these discrepancy in the surface form text space and situation model um, are in, you know, lead, cue the viewer that they need to be doing this updating. So uh, in the third instantiation, in the sixth instantiation of this, the can scene, Dolores and, and uh, William start their adventure, um, and uh, you know William falls in love with her. But in the ninth episode, they get uh, split up, and we know that William is searching Westworld for Dolores. Um, and, and in the ninth, uh, or in the tenth episode, the Man in Black catches Dolores and tells the story of William when William finally finds Dolores. 
And that's our final instantiation of the CAN scene. And um, in this instantiation, uh, there's no, there's very little overlap in the surface form because the producers are using point of view shots, uh, uh, perspective taking and point of view shot sequences to uh, indicate that it is William who is seeing this, um, uh, the, the, the event, uh, the events of Dolores, you know, going through her routine after he had this meaningful experience with her. Um, there's lots of overlap in the tech space. Uh, but the situation's different because, the, uh, and we get additional information from the man in black narrating this that this breaks um, uh, William and essentially is the thing that transforms him eventually into who he becomes as the man in black. Um, and uh, so, this uh, these differences uh, require us to, uh, um, a major updating of the event model where uh, we now need to um, uh, update the mental model that, to understand that uh, the um, events involving William Dolores happened in the long ago past. Um, it also um, uh, requires uh, updating the mental model to reflect the fact that, um, you know, that um, William and the man in black are one and the same. And, you know, the, the, this kind of updating, this level of updating is effortful and perhaps one of the reasons why some people found um, the, uh, the, the series difficult to understand. So I, I, I hope uh, that um, um, uh, I've conveyed um, that um, uh, the comprehension of serialized TV in, 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 involves building integrated mental models uh, that um, reflect the story world model, the event, character, and rule models. These models are iteratively refined and updated. Uh, TV series may use conventions to signal to the viewer that important information is being presented to, uh, to support updating. And we've tried to use these constructs to explain a convention in Westworld. So I hope I've illustrated that the constructs delineated by uh, theories of narrative comprehension may have utility in understanding the, the psychology of serialized TV, um, and, um, or at least one aspect of it. Um, Zoe, uh, I think, talked about other kinds of social aspects of um, uh, the experience of serialized TV that uh, we might want to uh, look to other areas of psychology uh, to help us understand. Um, this phenomenon deserves interdisciplinary attention. You know, to that end, I, I always like to point out uh, a book by Dixon and Bortolosi. Dixon is a cognitive scientist. Bortolosi is a, a cognitive narratologist. And uh, they um, wrote this book uh, to describe what uh, uh, interdisciplinary endeavor involving the behavioral uh, behavioral sciences and narratology might look like. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. That was fascinating. Um, so we are now happy to begin the discussion. The first question is for both of our speakers. Do you think there are any concepts or ideas presented by another speaker which resonate with your own research, which you think are relevant to you so you can maybe use them in your own research? Thank you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say unequivocally yes, um, and I have notes, um, but I'll hand uh, uh, this over to Zoe first. I mean, I think one of the things that's so great, I think, about this seminar series is that we both you know, approach this from quite different perspectives, but it's so interesting to see how the other perspective can really enliven our own work. Um, there is, you know, there's a kind of a growing body of cognitive research in film studies, which is not something that I do personally. It's, you know, I read it occasionally, but I think certainly when thinking about our engagement with an extended serial TV narrative, um, I really, I really like that, how you kind of presented the mental models and particularly that question of memory retrieval, because that question of memory is sort of so central to our understanding of serial TV and the difference between serial television and suddenly cinema, because cinema does not require that same kind of memory. 
And I often kind of approach that from thinking about, I guess, a kind of um, like shared memory or the collective intelligence when you're looking at audiences or fan communities who are kind of working on building this together. Um, but I think there's also a really nice way that we can think about that in relation to the work that someone else does themselves. And, you know, I sort of mentioned the idea of working through, which is an idea that I really love. Um, and certainly in terms of thinking about how a viewer might then go back and think about certainly in Westworld, how that final twist changes everything that you've seen before and to kind of do that work themselves. Um, um, I, I will follow up on what you're, what you, because one of the things that you said is related to something that I wanted to, um, wanted to talk about. I have lots of things, or at least I'll try and talk about sort of uh, three things that I, I think are important. Um, one, I, you know, as you were talking, you know, I'm thinking what makes TV TV, what makes serial TV, serial, what makes something serialization? And I think we need, and I don't know if this is, exists, kind of like a feature-based way of describing. You know, I, 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 I kind of reject the question, is um, X serial TV? Because I, I think it's a false flag because it implies that there are necessary and sufficient conditions that make something serialized TV when really it's a cluster of features. And some of the features are inherent to the narrative. Some of the features might be um, inherent to the psychological experience of it. Some of it might be uh, contextual in nature in terms of how we access it. Um, so I, I think we, I think, I think we very much need to begin if, if that doesn't, if it does exist, if there is a paper out there that lists out and begins to, these are the things that make, uh, that are the feature, a feature-based way of describing, I would love to, uh, um, to know what that is. I can see that in what you're saying. You are, I don't know if you're thinking about it in a feature-based way, but you are certainly mentioning a list of features that I think could be articulated that help us understand what the phenomenon is. Um, I also, um, uh, so one of the things about my field is like many areas of psychology, it's a reductionist way of thinking about something. And a criticism of early, um, early uh, of, of many of the theories of, of, of comprehension that I've you know, in writing by me uh, and others, is they, they kind of treat comprehension as, you know, the, the experience of narrative as if it's happening in a vacuum. Um, and it isn't. Uh, you know, our experiences happen in a larger context. There's this really great framework uh, that was in this, um, uh, the RAND report on comprehension that was primarily authored by Snow, uh, Catherine Snow. Uh, um, it's successful. RAM report on comprehension. If you Google it, you'll find it. But they talk about, they're mostly talking about comprehension in the context of academic and ac uh, con uh, context, not the experience of narrative. Um, but one of the things, the points that they make is any given literacy activity happens in a larger context and that matters. It affects us. And when I hear you, you're, you're talking about serialized TV, a lot of what you're talking about is the social context in which these experiences are embedded. And I think that very much is uh, um, related to um, the experience of serialized TV. There's a, um, a, a prominent new theory of reading um, uh, by my colleague, Ann Britt, that describes reading as a problem-solving activity, and it's hard to construe, um, you know, experiencing narrative as in a in a problem-solving-like way. But one of the things that they um, they um, they argue is that we are engaging in, you know, we're consuming the information, but we're engaging in other kinds of activities that can affect that consumption. And I think serialized TV and the water cooler phenomenon, it bumps this kind of activity up in a manner that cinema, you know, movies don't afford because as, as you noted, Zoe, you don't have this break between the narrative elements. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to talk about is I think one of the challenges um, that um, 
um, uh, streaming removes from the, the you know that uh, the weekly is the memory demands. I watched Westworld with my wife um, when it was coming out or a little bit after. I think we could have binged it, but we were watching it about one episode every week and a half. And I got you know four or five episodes in. And I was like, I I, I can't. I, I threw up the tap. Uh, but in preparing to uh, write that paper with Jeff, we picked Westworld. I forget why uh, we picked it. Um, and then then I binged it, not in one day, but over a course of a week, where I watched an episode or two uh, um, each night, and it was a fundamentally different experience. Still, a, um, still confusing, <laughs> but the reason why it was fundamentally different is I had easier access to knowledge that I, I gained and it was stored in my mental model. Um, so over time, uh, you know, memories um, do deteriorate um, and uh, it becomes harder to access memories from prior episodes as time progresses. Uh, and uh, streaming kind of removes that. But I think it also, um, it's, it affords that removal, but it also, um, I think, um, does not afford some of the social, psychological experience of uh, of um, of of narrative that you described, um, like the marking of a week, and the ability to talk about these things and engender excitement with your friends over the course of a week. So I know I said a lot, but I thought a lot. So. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, just to go back to that question of memory, and certainly one of the reasons why we do see so many, you know, dense shows like Westworld and, and Lost is because of the ability of people to rewatch things, which, you know, obviously 20 years ago that wasn't, you weren't able to do so, so well. Um, I was also thinking when you were talking about certainly, you know, with, you know the mental models, um, like the role of the television previously, and sort of what that is kind of functioning to do, which you know, I, I, I love previously, is I just find them fascinating little textual objects because they almost act like they're a reminder of what happened, but they're also a preview of the episode because it's telling you these are the things that you need to know. So you know, oh, this plot element's going to come back in this episode, or this particular relationship's going to be important here. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. But I think, again, you know, that question of memory, there's a really interesting question how whether that's something that's really key to how we're defining, you know, that distinction between something that's more episodic and something that's more serial, because I know that um, that's often how sort of in popular language you would define the difference between the two and that serial TV has a memory and episodic television doesn't because, you know, the characters don't remember what happened in previous episodes. And I guess... You know, maybe if we're thinking about, like you said, if we're sort of trying to come up with a feature based kind of approach to it, maybe that is also something, you know, not just to the characters, but us as well. Right. Yeah, because uh, I think I, 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 if I was to work out a feature based way of describing this, I think it would um, uh, have attributes of the um, of the uh, um, of the, you know, of the show. You know, it, w w what what are the inherent aspects of it but it would also have um uh, describe what's involved in in the viewer um you know and what's required of them um uh, uh, uh you know I, i've done this sort of uh exercise in trying to understand what's similar and different across reading uh, uh um um reading a text uh, re uh viewing a comic or reading a comic and watching a movie where what is what is happening at the psychological psychologically? And I think it um, it's uh, um, uh, I, I think a feature based way of describing it would need to specify not just the artifact um, but the, uh, the psychology of it. Um, I, you know those uh, re previews are really really important and they're very important when you have to. Um, uh, um, uh, when a, an episode is uh, bringing us back to events that happened in another s season. 
you know, it, it, you need to be reminded of the events of that uh, of that prior season. Um, one of the uh, one series that really forces you to um, that um, the, that later seasons have an impact on your understanding of earlier season is Attack on Titan. Uh, if you haven't watched it, um, it is there's lots of ambiguity in the first um, uh, season that you don't even know that it's ambiguous. You have no idea that it's ambiguous. But when you get to the later uh, seasons, it explains really complex inter uh, um, uh, uh, social interactions that happened in the first season. And uh, I haven't rewatched it, um, but I was watching it with my family and my uh, a daughter and my wife had seen the entire series and my son and I hadn't. And they were like, their experience of rewatching it was very different because um, they had the ability to access later information when understanding the current uh, episode. So if, if folks haven't seen that series and are interested in this experience, it's a really great example that um, uh, helps you understand uh, the, the importance of knowledge retrieval. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. If anyone ha has any questions, please ask. In the meantime, I'll ask my question. It's actually a question for both of you, but it's a bit different. Um, yes, thank you, Patrick. I'll just ask you um, in a minute. So the question is about communication, because art in a way is interpreted as a communication between the viewers and the person who is making the art creator. And for example, there are some scientists who develop these theories, say, for example, Vittorio Galese assumes that um, the way we communicate with people in real life is similar to the way we perceive art, because art also involves understanding of other people, their intentions, just as real communication does. But at the same time, of course, we all agree that art is a bit different form of communication compared to real life. And um, so first up, maybe my question is for Joseph. Um, your mental models, they involve person perception. They involve understanding of the event and the world which is happening and some biographical facts about the people. For example, that William is man in black and that Teddy is actually a robot, not a human. But they also involve my understanding of, say, for example, William as a person. So when I find out that he is that William is man in black, this might change my perception of man in black. Say in the beginning, I think he's just evil and nothing more. But in the end, I kind of I can change my understanding of him as a human and see his motivations as more complicated than just being evil. So I'm just the question is in these mental models you develop, do you think that understanding of other people and the, how we change the way we understand other people in the serial television, whether this is a, somehow a specific part of the mental model, something which is different compared to my understanding of the biography of the character, my understanding of the events which are happening around, um, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you are so, able to um, hear, sorry. Yeah, yeah in, um, if, if you go to the, um, you know, if you look at the literature, uh, that, you know, in theory, they do not make this distinction between these different kinds of mental models that um, if you go to the um, like the the, uh, the primary theories, uh, they don't make this distinction between um, uh, different types of mental models. And this is something that um, that uh, uh, Jeff Foy and I um, um, argued that th they probably do. So I, I first want to um, make that if it, it, you won't find this um, uh, prevalent in theory. You will find researchers that are uh, beginning to, um, you know, they, they're doing studies that suggest that maybe we do build these sort of very detailed representations of character. So like my colleague David Rapp um, has, um, done research on, you know, uh, understanding and developing uh, representations of, of character. And he has a, um, so at least one chapter where he talks about development of, of character over, um, over a series and, and what that might involve. I 
I, I do think, and I have argued this point, uh, like Galisi and a few other people, that there's a verisimilitude between how we understand the real world and how we understand and represent narrative uh, experiences. We're using some of the very same cognitive systems. Um, uh, and um, we, um, you know, there's pretty robust evidence in social psychology that people build complex representations of others that involve um, perspective taking, you know what they know and how that differs from what you know. And, um, you know, you, uh, you may represent goals um, and beliefs and values. Uh, and, you know, we will, we will build enriched representations of characters to the extent that we're, we're given the information and afford us the ability to do that. And I think that's one of the main differences between cinema and, and, um, and, and movies is that we are given a lot of information to build these very rich representations of, of characters uh, that you know two hours of a film may not quite afford. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's one of the things that I find different about experience. And, and I love thinking about adaptation. And, you know, I have like only one study on on this, uh, but it's one of my favorite things to experience um, adaptation. And but one of the things that always I always find so unsatisfying about adaptation is how much less information you have about what makes a person, a, a character, a character that narratives there. There's a prolonged prolonging, prolonged experience in, in experiencing a narrative. Uh, in a novel, rather, a novel that enable us to build these enriched representations of characters as well. And, you know, it just it, it doesn't afford building that kind of representation. So I would argue that we're building very similar kinds of representations of people and the, and the de degree to which they're en enriched representations depends on what kind of information a prolonged exposure and the kinds of information that we're um, that are provided to us. Um, I hope that you know is consistent with, with, with what you're asking. Yes. I just don't know if there's a lot of research in my field on building character representations of characters. I'm sure some people are doing it. David Rapp has stepped into this to uh, to, to, uh, to some extent, um, but it, it's not central to my field. Great, thank you very much. Just a quick similar question to Zoe about this communication. In your presentation, you had this citation that television is all about seeing other people. And although art is interpreted as a form of communication, it is not as a communication in real life because I cannot directly interact with a movie or a theater or with the artist, usually as a rule. But do you think that television is kind of, a serial television is kind of an example, is an exception of this rule because especially if say we have one season with several episodes but then we have a season two the season two is filmed after season one obviously and maybe the authors they kind of take into account the reaction of the viewers and they can even kind of in a way interact with the viewers in season two um do you think this is something unique about serial television that it is it involves a more dynamic communication between the viewers and the art makers compared to other art products? Yeah, even 100%. That's a great question. Um, and I think absolutely. And I think it is because of the fact that it is an unfolding, unfinished text, unlike something like um, a, you know, piece of art or a finished cinematic product. Obviously, within a television series, an episode perhaps, you know, can stand on its own or can be seen as kind of, you know, a text in and of itself. There is a very big debate about at TV studies, what is the text? <laughs> is it the program? Is it the episode? Is it the season? Is it, you know, something smaller than that, which we won't get into. Um, but I think in terms of this question of communication, absolutely, television does promise and in some cases absolutely allow that feeling of being able to interact with the world in much more detail. Uh, there have absolutely been cases in which fan responses or audience responses have changed things later on. Um, 
sometimes, you know, in very sort of specific ways in terms of what people have been saying. At a very, very base level, that's what ratings do. If your show is not getting very good ratings, then they're going to do something in the next season to try and boost it in some way, um, which is not something that we perhaps see so much in the art world. And again, to some extent, this comes back to television status as a highly commercialized medium. Um, certainly if we're looking at broadcast TV, even streaming television is still does what it needs to in order to uh, you know, gain and maintain subscriptions. Um, but yes, absolutely, I think that is a really key thing that serial television promises that other art forms don't in the same way. Fantastic, thank you very much, Lou. And now we have a question. Um, Joe, if you don't want to comment, if you want to comment, that's okay. If you don't, then um, I, I want uh, Patrick to be able to answer. Uh, yes. Of course, I, you know, lots of stuff said that was cool that I could comment on, but I'd like to give Patrick a chance. Yes, Patrick, please ask your question. Sure, that's great. And um, thank you both for really, um, you know, interesting talks. Um, my question is just about um, television as a sort of unique medium, and it's different from cinema. And uh, I mean, we were discussing Westworld, you know, written by Jonathan Nolan and. Um, it brought to mind the sort of fan base around um, the Nolan brothers and their sort of puzzle st uh, storytelling. And it seems to me that you sort of can't watch Tenet without um, learning the sort of the tools about what non-linear time looks like in cinema, you know, through um, his other films, earlier films like Memento and so on. So it, it seems to me with, with these kind of filmmakers, there is a sort of fan base and there's, a, there's water cooler discussion. And there's a kind of non-closure to the films that generates continual talk afterwards and uh, you know people revising their views in light of the subsequent films and so on so um or even sort of film series is that so there seems to be serial qualities to some some works of cinema that would be really regarded as genuine works of cinema and i'm, I'm wondering how how strictly you see the border between the cinematic and the television um I might go first, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that is a question that is very, I mean, that is a question that's, you know, debated everywhere, both in the scholarship and in the popular press in terms of where that line is at the moment. Um, I think that there are, there's lots of discussion about what we might call a cinematic TV. So it is things like your big HBO blockbusters when they have, you know, film auteur directors, high budgets, higher production values, and etc. Um, I would think that the thing that still very much makes them television, though, is this question of a serialized story, which is not something that Tenet can do necessarily. Um, there are films that are increasingly lending themselves towards serialization. Certainly the Marvel Cinematic Universe is one. Um, other extended film franchises like you know, The Fast and the Furious are others. That's not as densely serialized as something like the MCU is. Um, and again, there are reasons, um, there are industrial reasons for why we see that in terms of um, pressures on cinematic blockbusters, like on the box office and sort of trying to minimize risk. Um, and serialization is the best way to minimize risk because you know you've got a built-in audience. Um, but in terms of how exactly we kind of draw that line between what is cinema and what is television, um, I, think, I think maybe the better question is to think about how we're we defining what is cinematic perhaps and what is televisual and are there ways in which we can see our serialized film franchises as perhaps drawing from things that have historically been things that we associated with, you know, televisual elements that we perhaps associate with the small screen. Um, I don't know if that entirely answers your question. I find this debate sometimes a bit frustrating. <laughs> like, certainly, um, I, I don't like the term cinematic television just because I think it's a bit, it, it's, it's kind of reductive and is perhaps um, trying to assert a value hierarchy on television that isn't actually necessary to be there. But I think, um, I think it's a really, really interesting question at this particular point in time when there are ways in which the boundaries between the two are increasingly blurring. And again, serialization is a key way in which we see that. Um, this uh, is a little bit outside my pay grade. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> no, this is, I can only uh, speculate. This is a little bit more in uh, Zoe's, um, this question, Zoe's um, uh, ballpark. Uh, but, uh, you know, I cl clearly, um, uh, well, I will say from my perspective, um, a, a lot of, uh, much of my research focuses on the extent to which people respond to a structured experience. Like, I, you know, if I want to understand how people, people construct the mental model for a narrative, I have a theoretically uh, guided description of its structure, and I assess the extent to which they behave or their memory is consistent with that structure. And, um, you know, in, 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 in TV, they are creating this structured experience where you watch an episode and there is a beginning and end to that episode. And uh, there is a, you know, there is a plot structure to it that they've created that they want the viewer to understand. And, you know, they might be not thinking in terms of represent, but I'll use that term represent. And in cinema, it's, you're going to have a very different structure. It's sure there are scenes, but you know, the, 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 the narrative arc is not created in the same kind of structural uh, structure. So, uh, you know, our, you know, we, we, uh, we, if we're understanding a, a narrative as it was intended, we are going to represent more or less the uh, structure that the producer created. And um, uh, TV shows are, are, are have a particular structure where it's experiencing in that way, and it's a different structure than um, cinema. So I think part of the experience is has to do with how we are building these mental models. And, and, um, and, uh, uh, but, that is only part of the explanation. I think another part of it is a lot of the contextual kinds of, of experiences that Zoe was talking about in her, her presentation that are part of what makes uh, the cinema different than, um, than TV. And I, I, I'm not sure, I, to me, I, you know, cinematic TV, I think is more of a um, aesthetic, may, ha may have, aesthetic um, uh, uh, value to label it as such. I'm not sure it, um, I think that's where that label might be useful uh, in helping us understand something that's, that's uh, distinguished uh, di di differences in the aesthetic experience, if that has its value. Um, but from my end, uh, I'm not sure that would matter um, unless, Cinematic TV was creating a different structured experience than uh, non-cinematic TV. Thank you for so much for such a, a lively discussion. I guess uh, uh, I have not really a question, but just perhaps uh, uh, a comment just to, to close up and perhaps bring the, the two uh, points of view together. Because, uh, um, Joe, when you were talking about your experience uh, of watching the series, uh, um, like almost once a week uh, with your wife and then intensively been to watch it, um, it kind of made me uh, think about the Berlin theory of the inverted U-shaped pleasures when he theorizes the fact that uh, we, we like things that are kind of medium complexity. And uh, I think that your model kind of gives the possibility to kind of quantify the complexity uh, of, uh, of a series and perhaps uh, bringing Zoe perspective, actually that could be also quantified in how much engagement and uh, how much people actually like the, the series. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, it's not really a question, but perhaps uh, just a comment and a possible way of collaborating going forward. Um, I see you're both nodding, so I'm assuming this <laughs> might be, uh, something interesting uh, to explore in the future. Um, so yeah, um, this was just a, yeah, uh, a comment and we, we ran out of time. So, um, 
Perhaps I just I just want to close thanking uh, both uh, our speakers uh, and uh, um, thank you so much for uh, for joining uh, us today for this seminar. I'll just uh, remind you that next week we'll have uh, a seminar about imagination uh, with our guest speakers Gerald Kupchik and Judy Wolf. Um, so again, thank you very much for being here. And uh, um, Marina, if you'd like to to say something. Just thank you all. Um, I'll be happy to see you next week. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for our speakers. Thank you all. Thank Pleasure. you for attending. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye.